man to man Combat hand to hand, horns locked Ready for the last stand, elbow drops, kicks fade bang If I connect you, levitate, better settle mate Lights out, knocked out by the heavyweight it's Toby from Heavyweight MMA. Lucky today to be with Master Lolo Hemuli, a professional coach in kickboxing, boxing, and MMA. Um, very well-known man in New Zealand, held in very, very high regard. Uh, I feel very honoured to, to be able to talk to you today, man. It's great. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks for the kind word, Toby. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to be here, bro. Thank you for inviting me. Okay, so um, Lolo, I was looking at your history and... Um, one thing that has sprung to my mind, which I hadn't really uh, put together, was you know all the all the guys that are fighting that are kind of ha have your lineage. A lot of them have a links to China, right? Lots of fights in China. Yourself have been over there fighting, um, and it all seems does that all link back link back to your um, to your old Sifu in New Zealand as well? Is that how that connection yes, between yes. China all came about? Hundred uh, percent. Yes, my uh, my coach uh, Sifu Philip Lam. He's originally from China, and um, he's been in New Zealand since 1975. I started training with him in 1978, and um, yeah, had my first fight in China back in 1982. So uh, he's got a, a very strong connection with lots of promoters there. Uh, so you know, we were lucky enough to to get it hooked up and get a lot of our guys. Uh, Start from race for Jason Sadi, all the, all the boys, and now uh, Israel and Adesanya uh, and uh, Eugene Bam and some of the, the boys from CKB. So um, yes, uh, yeah, we, we're very very um, fortunate to have that that connection with uh, through Sifu uh, Philip Lam. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, right? Because I, I was again, I was listening to um, to your Sifu talking, Philip Lam talking about like his history and and other people talking about it, how he was he was originally a uh, uh, from a kung fu group, uh, it's uh, called Liga Kung Fu, right? Silam Liga. Silam. My wife is Chinese. I asked her what's Silam, and she said it's a it's a temple or something. So some sort of temple related oh, kung it's, fu. It's Shaolin, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Silam is Shaolin, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. And uh, yeah, the funny thing is, I'm actually based in China now. So all this thing kind of rings very interesting to me, you know, because you know, you guys, you guys talking in interviews about going to Kowloon and having some issues over there with your boxes, and then. <laughs> Going to China and then all these guys from from City Box Kickboxing talking about their their efforts in China, how it helped them to be what the fighters they are today. Um, obviously, Brad Riddell and and Adesanya and these guys did a lot of time over there, right? And and also um, Blood Diamond, who I just spoke to the other day. And um, yeah, it's very interesting, man. Coming from Kung Fu teacher that then decides to teach Muay Thai and then to New Zealand branching out. It's just a it's an interesting story. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, were, we, were, we were doing a lot. I, I actually come from a boxing family when I grew up. But uh, yes, uh, Kung Fu, but uh, Sifu Philip Lam was always promoting uh, freestyle fighting and kickboxing and, and uh, you know. So, um, and uh, then he, during the 80s, he brought in a, a Thai instructor by the name of Yosot to, uh, to teach us uh, Muay Thai. And, uh, you know, we're training and then he started bringing more and more Thai um, former champions uh, and, and coaches here in New Zealand. So uh, we were lucky because that way we didn't have to, to travel to Thailand, you know. Uh, but we were doing that a lot and sort of evolved from there. You know? So, yeah. And back then that was pretty forward thinking, right? Like there, was, there wasn't many people doing that, like taking taking Thai, Thai national people to start teaching Thai boxing in other countries, right? Back then, that was a, that was a kind of new thing to do, yeah? Yes. Well, it, it's, uh, uh, I, yeah, when we, we went to, we went to, to, to Hawaii in 1980, and, and, and I fought this guy, uh, his name is Matt Nakoa. He was, I think he was in the military, but he was leading uh, Thai boxing in, in when, when the army was based in, in, in Thailand and, and uh, I fought him and he was, that's the first time I felt a, a different kind of power of the kicks and he was smashed my leg. So I asked um, Sifu Philip Lam, so, you know, you know, how can we land this? And, you know, um, so uh, he's, he's pretty open-minded. Uh, he's not just a, a Kung Fu instructor. He's very, very op uh, open-minded. So he, um, yeah, he brought in Kyosot and then uh, we started learning from uh, from the Thais and 
and now everyone else doing it and a lot of New Zealand um, clubs uh, see us doing really, really well. We, we were like ahead of the competitions. Uh, everyone else was only doing kickboxing and, 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 and kicking and combined with boxing and, you know, uh, but we were doing actually doing Muay Thai and, and um, so we were a bit ahead of accommodation. Everybody saw that, so they started traveling to Thailand and Atlanta. Uh, and now it's uh, even more even playing fields. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is. Uh, yeah, they slowly caught on and, and caught up with the Thai boxing leg kicks and everything. It was interesting time back when it was a full contact kickboxing base, right? Where it was like high kicks and and punching. And then in Australia, I'm not sure if it was the same in New Zealand. We had like these full contact Kung Fu tournaments that were kind of where they started to use leg kicks and they started to incorporate a little bit more than, than the normal kickboxing. Yes. Yeah. Well, I, I, I took a team, uh, to Queensland, um, uh, Paul Briggs, Strata, I think Dave Briggs, he, he was, he was promoting and he was apart from, uh, Malcolm Anderson and and Dave Briggs and and a guy called Rod Stroud in in Western Australia. There weren't that many people doing Muay Thai in Australia too back in the eighties and 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 nineties. So we we took a team there. We we did pretty good because um, we were doing full Muay Thai training and of course we always do boxing here. So uh, yes, um, but now it's everyone is doing it and uh, yeah. Yeah, I remember back in the old days, uh, the Briggs, the Briggs brothers doing demonstrations of Thai boxing to people in in shows, so that people could actually see, oh, what is this new thing? You know, it was a new thing back then. I remember those young little young boys up in the ring kicking the pads, right? Yeah. And actually, um, yeah, your influence is felt in Australia too. I know I, I was, uh, I heard uh, Nugget McNaught talking about you as a, you know, as a very high level trainer and someone that he's learnt from before. Yeah, I, I that that show I just told you about. That's when I saw uh, um, Kerry McNaught. Uh, he was, I think, he was training under Malcolm Anderson, and he fought a guy called um, John Ford. I, I actually can't remember who won. I won the fight, but I saw him in a changing room, and uh, I don't know. I think I think Malcolm was going to do the. Uh, commentating or something, and, and and he was there by himself. So I just went up to him and saw this uh, this this young guy sitting there by himself, and I asked if he needed any help or something like that. And we became mates. And then um, and then uh, you know he started bringing fighters here to our shows, and and he he, he traveled to Thailand, and now he's still in the you know uh, you know um, kicking butts everywhere, and uh, one of the top coaches in Australia. And so I was very very. Uh, you know, very, very fortunate to, to cross path with, uh, you know, with uh, Nugget and there was two mates, you know, now and then we, we get with each other on the, um, you know, internet, uh, social media. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm hoping to catch him for the show, but he's just a hard man to catch. He said, yeah, okay, but I'm just wait, <laughs> waiting to catch up with him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, now you were born in Tonga. Is that correct? How did you make your way over to Aotearoa? Well, I, I, I came here in 1974. Um, my family was here before uh, in during the 60s, but I, I grew up with my auntie in, in, in Tonga and I didn't get to join my, uh, my brothers and, uh, you know, uh, two of my brothers uh, until 1974. And uh, yes, fresh from, the, fresh from the island, yeah. Yeah, man. And, and um. Being of, of Tongan heritage and working a lot with the, the Maori people, I'm interested in like, how does that relate to, to training and fighting as these, these races are seen as warrior race? Like, how does it relate to then moving into kickboxing and fighting, all these sort of things? I mean, uh, the, the, most Polynesians uh, have a very similar sort of culture and, you know, but, you know, uh, help it, it, at our gym, you know, we, we have different races there. You know, uh, you know, one time we, 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 we decided to count how many, I mean, back in Belmore days, uh, how many uh, people come from different ethnics and, and, uh, and countries and culture. And we had about over 20 different races, even back then. So, um, yeah, but, you know, uh, funny thing is that I'm, I'm Tongan, 
spent most of my best fight as a uh, Samoans, you know. Mm. <laughs> and then yeah. you know, I talk about Ray Sefo and Jason Sadi and you know, um, uh, yeah, Sefo brothers, Amatangi, and you know, we had a lot of champions, but I, I, I never had a, a Tongan kickboxing champion back in the days. And you know, um, yeah, it, it just depends who walks in the door at the gym, really. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So such a mixed uh, boiling pot of of uh, people with or races, right, within Australia and New Zealand as well. So yeah, you get you get every type of person, right? Actually, recently I was trying to get um Shane Young uh, onto the show, and he's just he's just dodged me. I'm I'm trying to catch him, but he he's taking some time. He was talking a bit about um like uh, about the land and about um the heritage of the of the country and how he thinks that people should connect more with the land, et cetera, as, as young, uh, young, especially young Maori people in the, in the, in New Zealand. Any thoughts on that sort of thing, man? You know, probably Shane will be the best uh, one to, to talk about the, the Maoris. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, it, at Palmora, it's not a, you know, with, with, with me, it's never about the politician. Never. It, I just happen to have some good fight as a politician. You know? Yeah. But I, I I, I welcome everyone that they walked into the gym, but of course uh, I do have some some Maori warriors to, who walk in at the gym, and you know, um, and and a lot of them they, uh, you know, a lot of them they they, they come from from rugby and they have really been tough enough anyway. So um, like the story with uh, Alexi Afanovsky, you know, he was a good league player. You know, a lot of them walk in there and they're already tough not anyway so uh but yeah it's, it's, it's i've never really sort of stopped and and trying and and recruit or focus on on you know um islanders or, or maori I, I just happen to 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 have a few but having said that we also have a few you know irish as well and uh you know middle east and you know and they they just as tough and <laughs> yeah so, man. yeah yeah that's good I, I, uh, Open door policy, right? That's a good thing, and uh, yeah, anyone who wants to come and learn to fight can come there. Correct? It, it's, and, uh, I guess it's, uh, uh, you know, a, a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, fighting. It's, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's cultural thing back, you know, for for Islanders. Yeah, it is true. I mean, uh, you know, when I when I grew up in in, in Tonga, and 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 you, you, anyone who came from there, you know, will tell you the same story. Uh, you know, we were. We were fighting almost every day, uh, meeting other kids at school, and and then nobody's taking anything personally, you know. It's just a way if, you, if you're going to go to another village, you know, uh, that's an situation you have to fight them, you know. And it's yeah. become a normal, and uh, but you know, it, it's it's totally different fighting on this on, on in the ring, you know. Um, you know, in, in in fighting in the ring, of course, you got to have strategy. You, gotta, you can't just go in there and then, you know. And start swinging, and 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 you know, it's a lot more skills you need to learn. But yes, yeah, uh, a lot of people come from the island; they're used to fighting, you know. Yeah, and and you've had so many different people walk into your gym over the years, right? And I just imagine, like, what what sort of traits do you see that are kind of common to the people that succeed? Like, what are the what's the main thing that makes people successful fighters when they walk in the gym? Well, I mean, it, it's uh, you, you're probably going to hear from everyone else. It, it's going to sound more like a cliche about you got to have dedication, you got to have all this, you got to set a goal. You know, some of the questions that I've been asked a lot over the years, and and say, so who who is the who is the best fighter you ever trained? You know, and and they expect me to say something like Ray Seth or Mark Hunt or whoever. You know, but some of the best fighters, uh, some of these island boys and, and, and the Kiwis and Maoris, they weren't hanging around long enough to, to, to hop in a ring, you know, for, for one reason or another. But, you know, I've, 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 I've had this kid that I looked at and said, man, this, this guy is going to be, you know, he's going to be so awesome. And then, you know, uh, about three months later, they never come back, you know. So there are so many guys that with this raw talent, then I look at them and then compare to how Ray Sefer and some of the other guys started, and these guys are way better, but they didn't have the, the discipline. 
then of course you you, you get a, a kid like Ray who who walk into the gym, you know he's got the he's got the talent, he's got the the commitment, he's got the you know um, perseverance when the training's hard and you know and and he made it, you know, uh, and I use the example of Ray Zephyr to a lot of some of the young guys that um, that came to the gym and. Um, I said, did you know that the whole one entire year, Ray only missed out three classes in the whole entire year, you know? Uh, he'll fight on Saturday and he'll be the first one there on, on, on Monday. And I already knew where Ray was going. I didn't have any experience of training uh, somebody to be a world champion. You know, back in 1992, when I was training with Ray and he was fighting and he was beating everyone. And I don't even know what it's like or the model on how you, you know, uh, train somebody it's like some sort of, if you like, a, a pyramid from the bottom to the top of the pyramid and then from there to the world title and, 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 and so on. I had no idea. The only thing I knew about that this guy is talented, um, coachable, he's committed, and um, Straight away, we're already talking about world title fight after he's only bad three or four fights, you know? And, and, and the reason why I, I and, and I'm trying to find that video from TV3 where Ray had, uh, he fought an Australian guy called Jamie Mayo, and, and he, I think he, he Ray stopped him in the first round. And Ray talked about uh, on TV that you know, you know, we, we already discussed possibility of a future world, world title fight, then probably people back then said, oh, you know, whatever, you know, dream on. Um, because he was, and the reason why I get him to, to, to suggest that we start setting goals is not because of, I had no experience, I had no, um, I don't even watch the video uh, because, the, uh, coverage of, of, of kickboxing and, and world I think in those days was nothing. It's, you know, it's next to nothing. I mean, you've got number one is rugby and then rugby for the first 20 sports and then the other sports, you know. So getting to, getting a chance to watch uh, a, a video of guys to, so you can sort of compare the standard was almost zero. I just talk about it because this guy, he's so committed and he's so easy to coach that I had to start buying loads and loads of VHS video. And I used to go to the Thai shop and I used to go and ask the, the, Thai, the Thai guy there, can you do me a favor, get your uh, friends or whatever come from Thailand to bring some Thai boxing videos. And we and I would stay up till about three o'clock in the morning and study that because Ray has over um, what do you call? I'm looking for the right word. He's already bypassed me in terms of knowledge. I I, I showed me everything I know, and he was beating everybody and beating uh, guys in Australasia. You know, so I had he needs to he needs more. So I had to grow. I had to you know hold. The old VH tape uh, where you sort of push and then you, you know, and you keep rewinding it back and forward. Uh, and I used to do that just to, so I can go back to the gym and, and give something to, to Ray and some of the other talented guys. Um, but yeah, I, I had no idea what I was talking about when I said, oh, let's go for the world title fight. It's, it's quite funny if you watch the video, you know, it's never been a, a world champion here in New Zealand. And the guy had about, less than a half a dozen fights and we already talked about world title one but it came true you know about half a dozen fights later uh ray was getting better and better getting more and more confident and then um, you know he won a world title and he's got about six, five or six world titles you know something like that but yeah you know when, when we talk about it i had no clue what a world title uh standard or how you train somebody in, you know but, and what, you know, <laughs> back then, what was his? What was his sort of? Who were the the key names back then when he was going towards a world title? Who were the sort of key names around, or who the key well, that's countries? 
that's exactly what I'm talking about. You know, they were, you know, uh, you know, there were guys like Rob Carmen and um, you know, oh, and 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 Ben uh, Peter Cunningham. You know, you get to see these guys, you know, from time to time. You know, uh, but we we had a lot of uh, video tapes to to analyze, and you know, and and uh, and and he was a a crucial weight. He would fight light heavyweight just so he can have fight, and he would starve himself. And we, because we didn't know anything about water loading and, and all the stuff that a lot of fighters now, you know, we didn't have all the, any of that technology, you know. So we, um, you know, we, we, we used to do it in the, the hard old school, some ways of chewing gum and, you know, uh, all those, yeah, yeah, been there, done that, you know. I did it too on my last, last fight. But uh, yes, I, I, I yeah, even with with what I knew, it wasn't enough because I have Jason Sadi, I have the the Dramatangi brothers, uh, you know, uh, Jason Zemoa, um, you know, the Conway brothers, and and had many many guys um, already won you know, the title and that South Pacific title, and um, so I, I I had to grow and and you know talent and, and heart training is not enough; they need more. And um, yes, so we used to, you know, used to stay up and, and, and study. And, and now nowadays you can just push your you know, fingers on a YouTube and, oh, this is fight in 1987 or boxing fight in 1930, kid chocolate or whatever. You can push it, push it but, but the old days was all, um, I had about hundreds of these old VHS video from boxing fight in the 1930s and all the way, you know. And you know we watch a lot of uh, Benny the Chet and you know um, Fujiara and all those Japanese guys and you know we, we, we had to I had to study a lot of those stuff and uh, and you know so I can so I can grow so I can have something to to pass on to, to Ray and the boys and you know because I, I was just a, a young coach didn't know what I was doing and, you know yeah so yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's how it came about. It was a real cowboy, uh, you know, beginning. That's awesome. Did you did you go to uh, Japan at all with Ray um, to any of his fights over there? Yes, yes, yes. Um, you know, I went there uh, until you know we we start going to Japan from 1996 right up to 2000, and Ray shifted to uh, to the US, to the US, and. Um, and I continue here at, at uh, Belvoir with, uh, you know, some of the boys that I have there. So, yeah. So back then, uh, K1 was such a massive, a massive thing. Can you tell me what it was like to, to be involved in that? Because it was just a massive crowds, right? It was like something we haven't really seen over our part of the world, right? Oh, mate, I, I had goosebumps. You know, we were in 1996 to go uh, after Ray. We were in Hong Kong. Ray was fighting uh, Kek Wood uh, Walker, and and he beat him, and um, and we got the message uh, invitation from Mr. Ishii, so he flew us to Osaka. There was a, a fight there, and, and Jason Zadi was actually fighting in there, because Jason Zadi was going back and forward. Um, uh, he had a, a Japanese coach there and a promoter who promoted him, and. Um, yeah, a guy called Ihara, you know. So Jason was fighting, and he's fighting Ivan Hippolyte yeah. from Holland. He's one of the legends that uh, we only get to see on the, on the video. And, and actually, Jason said he actually beat him with uh, that particular K1 where we got invitation. Um, but he was only fighting on a super fight, uh, middleweight, you know. So we got an invitation to, from Mr. Ishii to go there. We got a front row seat. And that's the first time I... I you know, I, I, I've been to such a, a, a huge event, um, you know, at the Osaka Dome, it's a, it, it were over 30 or 40,000 people, you know? And um, yeah, I, I, get, I get goosebumps just sitting there all excited, you know? Um, but yeah, I said, we, we had a, we sit down and have a negotiate with, uh, uh, with Mr. Ishii and, you know, he, 
gave us a, a team that we agree and, and happy with. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. Yeah, man. Some amazing fights came out of Japan. Ray Sefo, Mark Hunt was obviously one of the ones that everyone, yeah. everyone who knows fighting knows, right? That was an amazing fight. Were you there at that one? No, no, I wasn't. I, I uh, there was something that I, I was here, but uh, no, it's 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 a most uh, it's a most uh, talk about fight in Japan even today. You know? So yeah. <laughs> yeah, it still pops up on pops up on all the highlights of, of K1, right? These two standing hands down. <laughs> well, just That's, give you shot. Shot, you know? <laughs> That's it. That's it. Man, so um when you get these guys in, obviously your, you know, your history of coaching, what are your keys like? Uh it's hard to say, I know, but just an overall picture of how you would coach someone to be a good fighter, like just a general sort of idea. Like you have someone walk into the gym, they want to learn. What what steps to, does it take to become that that decent fighter? Well, it, it's uh, for, from a coach's point of view. Um, you know, the last guy that the first guy that, that I had a uh, uh, will sit down and 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 go through a goal and you know and you know all the things that every coach will tell you. You got to have consistency. You know, you, you got to have a commitment. You have to, you know. And, and and all this and, and you know I when I uh, now nowadays and uh, after a few because I already go to a few national and and stuff was to do and 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 you just it just get to a point now that if somebody really wants it and he come and approach you hey coach I, I, I this is my goal this is what I want to do you know. And as I sure, so we, we sit down and, and go through a goal setting and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, um, that he's fully committed. Because a lot of people say, oh, I want to be champion. But as soon as you put down and the program and what you need to do, and, oh, this is hard. You think I don't know that? <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, and then we, we go through. But, you know, nowadays, uh, um, you know, and for a long time now, uh, Toby, it's 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 no longer my goal. You know, if if somebody shows commit, I'll sit down and I and I help them, and, and we we have a good team as well. Uh, and so our goal is to help them reach their goals. You know, um, and um, yeah, I, I you know when people ask how many how many champions you train, I actually lost count because. I don't think it's important because the goal is not about me, it's about them, the better fighters. And, you know, I, I, I'm just so blessed and and happy that they choose me to be the one to help them. You know, they already got talents. You know, I know you, you can't win consistently with talent, but you still have to be a talented fighter. But, you know, commitments and, and uh, consistently and turning up, persevering, all the things that you ask a coach will tell you the same thing, you know. But uh, yes, it's uh, it's been an awesome journey. <laughs> yeah, man, and um, just listening to Eugene Behrman talk and yourself talk, um, there seems to be some similarities with the way you guys are cerebral. Like you think a lot about um, training, you think a lot about strategies. You you know, um, that that's something that you've kind of build up with your lineage like the people that are coaching now for you all had that sort of way is it that they that you guys all spend a lot of time analyzing things and and developing things from that you know mental perspective as well right yes i mean of course i mean it, it's uh you know first you gotta you know first you gotta have a plan but you know um you know and the old days i that there are some fighters that you involve them in, in your study uh, when you do a, a video analysis, okay? But then I, a, a lot of, uh, in the early days, I used to I used to think that, no, no, I'm just gonna study it and then put it through to the boys and then we do the drills. And, and I used to think that that was somehow kind of selfish or, but then I listened to Canelo the other day and, and he's, they, before he's fighting, um, Caleb uh, plan. They asked him, so, so what's the game plan? And he said, oh, I live with my coach. He, you know, he does it and he gets free. So I wasn't, at least I wasn't doing wrong then, you know, because, you know, 
um, because I have a sort of different strategies with the game plan. Of course, I have a, a plan. Everybody have, you know, every coach have a plan. But I look for um, for drills. If I if I'm lucky enough to to um, um, to get hold of the of the video of the phone and then then I set the thing I look for, and then then I create a, a some type of uh, drills or combination or whether counterfeiting or offense defense, and then. I get those tools and add it onto the pet work. So rather than this is a game plan, so sometimes most people they plan to, if you throw right hand, I'm going to ship through left hook. It never comes off because it's that little, um, when you think too much about it and you tense up and then you plan it like that, it usually doesn't happen. But if you, uh, if you, if you cons consistently uh, drill it repetitions, you know, after repetition and it's become automatic. And it is the game plan, but, you know, the fighter don't have to think about it. They just throw it. You just add it on and repeat it when you do your pet work. And, and, and to me, you know, because, you know, I, I don't, I don't look for, I don't look for, for, you know, for a particular thing that an opponent does in terms of striking or, uh, you know, uh, because fights is changed from fight to fight. Uh, what doesn't change is the habit they do, the habit when they get tired or, or when they get angry or when they get hit, you know, and, and, and some of them will get hit and they come in and throw everything at you. You know, or some of them will back off. You know, there's a little, there's a little details I look for, and then I pay attention to. I don't pay attention to, you know, the way they're throwing a lot of or strike or, or punch or kick because that changes from fight to fight. Uh, what doesn't change is whether they keep moving to your left or keep moving to your right, because these things they do unconsciously, and you know, if if he if he if he, if if his coach knows, he wouldn't be keep doing it, you know. Yeah. So um, yeah. So that, 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 that when you talk about uh, game plan and people talk about game plan, of course they have a plan. But the game plan is executed on pet work. So that way it become automatic to the fighter rather than have the extra pressure on him. You know? um, if I want him to keep moving to his left. I'm gonna hold a pet or put my pet holder to shut off the right and make him move his left. So after six weeks or five weeks of doing that, he does it automatically in the fight. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, yeah. Do, you, do you tell them that you're working on that? Like do you say we're gonna work moving I to mean, the I left mentioned more? it, but I mentioned it, but uh, in the early days I told them anything, but they never listened. But, uh, you know, because it's not add on to their system or their nervous system, you know. Uh, and muscle memory or whatever, if you want to call it that way. Yes, you tell them a couple of times, explain it, but you do it more. So that way it's locked into their, their system rather than you telling them. You know, sometimes it's going one year and the other year, especially with the pressure of the fights. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but if you, you know, it, it, it's, I, like I said, it's all cliche of, you know, repetition is the best instructor. It's, it's not a lie. It's true. Yeah. And 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 if you rep, if you keep repeating the same drill, which is the game plan, whether it's movement or strikes or combinations or counterfeit strategy, um, you drill that on a pet to a point where he wants to fight out. Oh, did I do that? Huh? So that that's the whole goal of of uh, you know that that's a uh, that's, I think that's what Canelo was talking about. You know, his coach would have put him through drills that likely to work against his opponent, but at the same time, make sure that he minimizes his own mistakes. You know. Yeah. Um, so I think I think there's a there's a high level. You know, where a lot of fighters focus on being told what to do because 
you know, if you simply work in a corner and, you know, it's most cases, it's, it's, it's actually about eight or nine percent of professional fighters I work with. A lot of them, they don't follow the game plan. If, if, if you don't re, uh, repeat drilling the same thing that I want you to do. So rather than doing, getting them to, to do it badly, you know, you drill that to a point where you only say it once or twice and they do it, ex execute it because they drill it from Monday to Friday. <laughs> awesome. No, that's great. Um, you okay. talked about the, you just mentioned the central nervous system and that's only the second time I heard someone mention that recently. And the other, the other time I heard it mentioned was talking about the CKB guys and, and how they use a lot of feints uh, that actually like interrupts people a bit and makes them actually fatigues people um, and their central nervous system, et cetera, just from waiting for these constant feints that are coming at them. Can you talk on that at all? Well, I, I used to go crazy on, on fainting. Um, when we do circuit or super circuit conditioning, we've got nothing to do with striking that. And we would have 20, 30 second resting. I should make your children and the boys faint as they rest. Uh, because a lot of people, they, uh, they never look at, at faint. They, they, uh, most coaches assume that faint is something you just told somebody to do and they do it. But fainting is, if you have to add into your, to your arsenal, your striking arsenal, because if you don't learn how to faint, people can't be bothered doing it because you get tired, because it's different. You know, your muscle memory is not used to it. You know, so you need to faint as part of your striking. I mean, I, that's what I believe, I, of course, other people uh, may not believe it, but um, so we, we add on fainting as, as part of, of your, you know, how you throw a lot of jab, throw a lot of kicks, for, uh, training, elbows, knees, whatever, you got to throw paint as well. So that way, it, it, you know, it, it doesn't come as a foreign thing for you and something that makes you, oh, no, I'm, I'm going to leave it out because it's, you know, so tiring, you know. But yeah. Of course, uh, you know, um, you know, like everything else, painting has to be done in speed um, or a broken rhythm because it's if, you, if if it's not, it's not a faint at all. I mean, you know. So um, yeah, I, I I really enjoy um, watching some of the analysts try and, and figure it out. <laughs> 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 That's Some true. American yeah. 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 Hey, um, I, I watched a bit of pad work. Um, you were teaching a, a young fellow. I'm not sure if it's your son or, or who you were teaching on the pads on, on YouTube. Um, and I just wanted to ask you about pad work a bit because when I think about you holding pads, I imagine how many killers have you held pads for over the years? You must have some, <laughs> some, some you must have oh, some man. sore elbows and sore shoulders, man. Good, you know what I mean? I mean, how do you take for, for how do you pay for Mark Hunt uh, when you for, throw full power? It's not fun, you know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, he hits very hard. But yeah, it, it's you know, I know there's a, a lot of thing about pet works, and you know, you can you can develop your own. I mean, my son, you know, he can develop his own pet work style and all the fancy stuff, and you know. Um, to me, the, 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 it's the, the key element of the pet work is um, having the ability, having the ability to 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 read um, and match the speed of your striker. You know, um, because if you, if you don't if you don't if you don't understand that, um, and if you don't understand that, there are bound to be some injury, either yourself or the guy you hold the bed for. You know, like I, I had this thing that I developed with, uh, I call a imaginary center line from your nose to your train partner's nose. So when you hold a pet, you only bring it here. But you can only do that when you adapt to his speed. If you bring it too early before he, he, he extends, you can, you know, you you can hit his hand, or if he's not uh, brace his knuckle for new guys, you can hit them. Or if it's too late, they get hyperextend. So having the ability to 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 read and and match the the, the punch on the, I call it a snap line, the, the line I 
I explained to you, it runs from your nose to your partner's nose. I call it a snip line, where this where they snip the punch. And even if I hold it up with a hook, I bring it here because it's the line of my head. Anyway, that, that's my belief. Uh, other people may have different, you know, but you know, there are so many different fancy bed work that other people do, you know, you have to, uh, because I, I never really, you know, I mean, I, I talk about Martin and some of those heavy hitters. Actually, you don't really hit your hand much from there, you just feel the impact. And, and you hate to take one of those ones in the head, okay? A lot of people uh, had the hand, I had my hand a, a lot because I, before I misread and miscalculate the speed of, um, of a new corporate guys, because sometimes they, they release the punches too early or, and it's not consistent. They can throw th you know, three punches and they all come in a different timing, you know? One, you had to release it too early or too, uh, or too, um, you know, too late or too early, and you know, and sometimes bang on. So these are the guys that actually had trainers' hands, not the experienced uh, fighters. You know? So, yeah. um, so that's uh, my thing. So is trying and, and um, I have to get them, even if they hate shadow box, I have to watch them shadow box, and then you can learn from their shadow boxing or their back work where they're going, how they're going to release their their power or you know. And then when you hold a pet, then you have a much better idea. Any other combos or any other effects and stuff, uh, uh, you can just stand on the YouTube, you can see as many as you can. But to me, it's like the key element is, is trying to adapt and, and, uh, and read you know, the speed of your training partner, whoever throws the bunch of you the pet. So to me, that's a key point. You know, anything else you can, you know, you can make up your own combo. Yeah, and do you, and you prefer to? Is your style of um of pad holding that you know? There's different styles, are more intuitive, or some people prefer just to follow like set certain combinations. The pad holder calling, or do you allow the fighter to actually like initiate, or you mix up both, or or what? Well, it, it's um you know, first of all, is pad holding. You should never throw. You know, this is what I told the guys anyway. You should never throw more than 80% power anyway. Um, and, and and even the even the speed, you know, so um, there are there are about three different uh pair holding. One is that you can do a, like a like the Thai freestyle, but even the Thai freestyle, they, they read the punch, but it doesn't mean they uh, you know you just respect out of uh, of the of the striker that you know they they hit the descent of the pad and they read it is but it's not totally freestyle you know otherwise you know every pet holder will get knocked out every day <laughs> yeah you know? they not, always hold it for the kicks too such right as, it's such thing as free free freestyle they respect and they want to hit the descent of the pad they want to kick in the right place even though it may seem that you know a fighter and and and, and his head man know what it's going to do, they still have control. You know, they say still have semi, uh, semi under control. And then you, then you talk about uh, the, the drilling to, to uh, you know, just to, to, to polish uh, a technique or prime mechanics, uh, bed holding, where you call it. Uh, and then of course, um, you know, um, you know, when you, when you um, go through a game plan, well, like I explained it before, you know, you, you bring the fight game into pet drilling technique and and you work on that, even though it's still pet holding, this is the combo that you want your fighter to use in the in the fight. So so the fight strategy, the polish technique in the, in the freestyle, but like I said, not a full free freestyle because that's impossible. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. And and what's your thoughts on uh, training fighters for switch hitting and, and training both stances? Is that something you do or prefer to keep with that natural stance? I, I teach a lot of kids now and I have kids as young as four year old. I, I teach them switching, you know, up to, you know. So for them, it's a lot safer, become habitual and, and become, they feel so comfortable on doing that. Um, 
you know, guys who are um, switching southpaw and, and orthodox, um, they're going to get hit a lot until they get used to it when they drink southpaw because you you switch your star and southpaw, but your brain reactions to right handed. So, you know, there's two things going to happen. Either you duck the wrong way or your brain's going to try and, and, and figure it out, you know, what stand you at and, and, and what defense pattern is going to bring out by the time it's too late. Uh, but you can keep doing that until you get to a point where um, if you, you feel comfortable, but, you know, you take a lot of shots for it. I mean, Israel, Adesanya is good at that. Um, you know, Crawford last week, you, you, you know, you saw him, he's, he's very comfortable, but, you know, uh, I, I get the guys to switch only, uh, only to lead, but not stay there long enough to defend as left-handed or right-handed if they suffer for. But yeah, it, it, but that's just me. A lot of people may not agree with that, but yeah. Yeah, man. No, it's a, it's a, it's definitely a good skill for people to have, right? Especially for that, those brief transitions, or if they suffer some sort of injury in the fight, right? They can, they can switch it over. It's not bad. Mm. Um. Wanted to also, I've got a few key things I just wanted to touch on. I hope, we, I hope you're okay to keep talking for a little while. Um, talking about cornering fighters, just again, just an overview of what your what your ideas are on cornering and successfully <laughs> cornering people. I know it's a big topic, but just wanted to know your thoughts on it. Yeah. No, it, it's, uh, I, I, I try and keep everything simple. Um, in fact, I, I don't go and watch fights. Uh, Unless I have to, unless one of our boys fighting or go and support fighter. If not, I, I I don't go and watch fights because when I watch fights, I'm cornering the fight from the seat. <laughs> you know, I'm starting looking for mistake and you know, enjoying the fight, you know. Right? So um, but yeah, I, I keep things very, very simple in a in a fight. I mean, all the, the hard training is done and um, you know. Um the only thing I I, I want the fighters to understand is to keep uh, their level of keep the emotion down, you know, because most fighters they go in there with way too much emotion. Um, so if if they can, if they can sort of control it and, and more relax, then they can absorb the the advices, uh, you know, much better. Uh, which why a lot of fighters that. You can have a conversation with me. If you, if you look at, at Israel Adesanya, who had so many fights uh, in China, he was fighting week in, week out, and, and Bradley Dell, they, they can almost try to have a, a relaxed conversation in between. Uh, some of the, the newer fighters, uh, younger fighters who are, are nervous, uh, you know, uh, you have to actually try and, 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 and find a way to make them relax so they can, you know. Uh, but having said that, I, I don't give away too much information. Um, if a fighter is doing well, I keep things very simple. If they're doing well, I just keep my mouth shut, keep my water, breathe, you know. You know advice in the basic thing, keep it distant, you know. Don't stand in the same place, faint if you were, you know, if you feel, uh, you know, don't do anything. If it's faint, just get him, you know, buy time to move out. I, I keep it very, very basic. I don't sort of, if the fight is doing well, I know a lot of people, they feel like they say something, I, I just shut up and give them a drink and they keep doing what you're doing, you know? So, um, yeah, I have a very, very simple method in the corner. Yeah, man. And you mentioned just then about um, hoping that fighters don't get too emotional so they can be rational and, you know, and fight better. Um, what are your sort of tips for, Firstly, I guess for a coach, coaching fighters for their psychology, preparing for a fight, and then I guess even for a fighter, like what do you think is the best way for a fighter to be when they're when they're approaching a ring fight? Well, I mean, it, it's uh, I, I I told him, you know, uh, at, at the beginning, um, you know, now is there are a lot of trainers now who teaching the uh, better breathing system, diaphragm and stuff, uh, that will help them control their emotion and help them relax a lot more and probably alert a lot more, you know, and uh, so they don't get too ton of visions. But uh, yes, I mean, it's, you know, uh, I, 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 I hear you, uh, 
podcast with Sam the other day, and uh, Sam said everything, you know, when, you know, because you, you have a, you have a, a bucket list to, to tick when you're going to a camp and your weight, um, eating right, your opponent, the fight game, game plan, conditioning, the little nicking entry, you know, uh, you know, once you train so hard, and then you do the conditioning and do the you know the rounds and uh, extra amount of round. Once you tick out all those boxes, I, I Sam put it differently. I can't remember how he put it, but you know you you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Once you tick all those boxes, don't you know the fight? You find that the fight is a lot more relaxed. You know, a, a lot of fighters they worry because of my fitness. You know, you know my fitness. I you know. So a, a lot of these things, but if you tick that box that your fitness is good, you, 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 you've done your fitness test, you've done, you know, your endurance, you throw this X amount of punches and kicks in, you know, training, and you, you've done this uh, X amount of round sparring. And once you tick all those boxes, um, then you, you find that your fight is a lot more relaxed because, you know, yeah. Uh, unless, of course, you come across uh, others that we have a, a very high level of, you know, good at that and playing the mind game, like people like Israel and Sana, and you know, they can upset you um, and then put you off your game. But in most cases, the more boxes they, that a fighter pick, uh, I find them a lot more relaxed and, and, and listen a lot better at the corner. Yeah, very true, man. Um, I've been on, we've been on for a little while, so I don't want to keep you for the full day. We'll just, uh, I've got one more kind of thing to touch on before I'll, I'll release you, <laughs> Master Lolo. Um, you mentioned before about people following passions that you, that people should follow their passions, that it leads to special things. What do you think people have gained uh, out of, out of combat fighting and fighting in general? Um, I think that. I, I think that uh, you know when when uh, you know a, a lot of fighters they, they they come to the gym for different reasons you know and um, a lot of them when they you know some some kid come there because they want to um, be a champion or amateur champion or Olympian uh, boxer or whatever uh, and then you're gonna have a lot of guys who just come in there because. They they want they know fighting it it's it's something that not everybody does it's, they know it's a dangerous game and and um, so they they want to take it on because if they can achieve that uh, some of their other goals in life and and uh, you know um, be a lot more easier because they gotta have that sense of of uh, you know uh, that sense of of success and sense of winning, not not the winning in the ring, but you know they 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 know they was they they, they achieved something very very hard because somebody in there tried to take his head off and 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 from there that lead them to give them a lot more confidence to go follow through and and uh, and and run a business. I I saw one of, of uh, guys that I was training with us about thirty years ago and um, and 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 uh, and. And he was telling his story, a very awesome story. Uh, this kid, he was a dyslexia, his name is Ben Tata. And, um, and he was told by the teachers that he couldn't, he's going to be a man to nothing because he was, uh, he was severely uh, dyslexic. And um, as soon as he, he left school um, at 15, when he turned 15, I mean, that's a legal age in New Zealand, you know. So he left school and started working, and, and three years later he started a business where he was making more money than the teacher. Mm. Uh, and then um, then he went on to uh, uh, he, he he come from a broken uh, family. He, he had it tough, you know. He, he had a young family to look after as well. But he um, you know uh, he went on and uh, you know he went on uh, and and he bought. Uh, he went in real estate, he bought a property, 
for 1.8 million, we shared using we shared lost one dollar, and he sold it immediately for about two point something million. You know, uh, so he the money he made, he went to uh, to start a, a orphanage, and then now starting orphanage in uh, in Philippines. And but he he was he looks the part. He would have been a, he would have been a champion, you know, and he fought a Japanese guy and his second of state fight at and you know, we fasted at him and he knocked him out and then he went on to business. But what he was trying to do, he was actually trying to there was one of his bucket lists um you know to, to conquer. And after that he was he was unbeatable. He was you know he could do anything. You know and uh, I advise him to write a book, you know, just get special and I think he could be a millionaire. So um yeah, yeah it's, it's it's one of those things, you know, like, you know, everybody know the danger of, of fight game. That's why people get married for a fight. They know it's dangerous. And even if they're confident, even if they're tough and they're strong, they school school, you know, they know it's, it's a dangerous game. But uh, achieving that, um, it's make, it, gives you, it gives you the confidence to, to do pretty much whatever you want to do in life. And I think that uh, that was his approach. I, I was looking at him, oh, well, this kid's going to be, you know, trying to be champion. But um, after that fight, he moved on and started running business. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, lot. Like I 100% agree. If uh, if someone can get through the ordeal of all the training and, and to get in the ring and compete, it definitely uh, makes them a stronger person and, you know, gives them a better chance at, uh, you know, pushing through adversity in life and, you know, standing out amongst the crowd, right? And uh, Lolo, I just had one more question uh, or kind of just your opinion on a couple of fights that are coming up. We've got some good fights in UFC coming up with uh, with a few Aussies and Kiwis fighting. I don't know if you know all these guys, but if you know, uh, obviously, you know, Brad Riddell's fighting a guy called Fitziev. Uh, any thoughts on that fight, man? No, no, but I'm looking forward to it. You know, I, I, uh, I, I don't actually, I haven't studied it very much. I never look at it much or, you know. Uh, but I know how tough uh, Brad Riddell is. But what I what I do know is that uh, they used to train together at at uh, Tiger Muay Thai in, in Thailand, and um, and and they both, you know, so they know each other, you know. So I'm looked that that, you know, they both agree to fight each other, and and they know it's going to be tough. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it, you know. I, uh, to be honest, I can't make any prediction. I don't, you know. Uh, I, I know uh, I know how tough Brett is, and, and apparently, you know, Brett speaks highly of the other guy as well. So, so yeah, I, I can't wait to that. That fight might might steal the show, you know. Yeah, that's you what know? a lot of people are saying, man. It, it could yeah. potential fight of the night because yeah, these guys have got exactly. seem very close, you know, close in their skill set. So it should be interesting. Yeah. So when, when, what's his name? Uh, 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 KG and uh, and Chandler, I actually predict that it's going to be a fight of the night. KG Chandler, yeah, you predicted that one, yeah. So I think I think this fight might be have the same uh, you know impact. True, and one other one before I let you go: the Kai Kara France versus Cody Garbrandt. Obviously, you know these two fighters pretty well. Um, thoughts yeah. on them? Let's go, guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's, it's uh yeah again I uh, you know I I I actually you know just so much based on what I'm saying this fight so I think I'll, I'll you know I stick with guy yeah but it's not gonna be easy fight yeah yeah true actually uh one point of interest where I'm where I am right now. Uh, in Macau is a place where I, f- I met a few of these guys from City Kickboxing in the early days. They came over to compete in Macau in a, a legend FC. Um, Dan Hooker, Kai Kara France, a few of the other guys over here competing in the early sure. days. Yeah. So it was great to meet them and then see them come up in the sport as they have. Yeah. Okay, uh, Master Lolo, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. And um, you've definitely given us a lot of uh, nuggets of your knowledge. Uh, obviously, not enough time to really go deeply into everything <laughs> that I, I could ask you, but you've really given us some some interesting things. So uh, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, Toby. You're welcome, brother. <laughs>